Hi, hi everybody. Hello everybody. Hope everybody's doing okay today. Um, it's great to see you all. Great to see you for this uh, this activity. Uh, the speaker actually. So um, today we have Kay Paul, who's a campaigns and policy officer for Wheels for Wellbeing, who'll be uh, talking today about infrastructure, social structures, and attitudes currently disadvantaged disabled people. So Kate is also one of Cycling UK's 100 women of cycling for 2022, so she'll be speaking to you today. Um, this session will also be recorded, and as you can see, we have Rachel here as a British Sign Language interpreter um, for your needs. So um, yeah, I'll just hand over to Kate, and uh, if there's a chance potentially maybe for the odd question at the end. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we can have questions at the end as well. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. Yep, so I'm going to talk for around about half an hour and then questions at the end. If anyone's got anything really urgent to say in the middle, put a hand up or whatever um, and do feel free to leave at any time if you need to or anything else. Um, so I'm Kate Ball, um, as I said, Campaigns and Policy Officer for Wheels for Wellbeing. Um, I'm going to just talk through the images that we've got on each page um, because um, I want to make sure that anyone with visual impairment also gets to... Um, hear what's what's on those so here we've got um, on the first page we're talking about equity and equity of travel with a concept that you should be able to make every journey every time safely comfortably and conveniently um, in the image we have an urban off-road cycle route showing four cyclists one riding a recumbent hand tricycle one riding an upright hand cycle that's clipped onto a wheelchair one on an upright tricycle and one on a standard bike And this doesn't want to move to the next slide. So next one, so just what we're going to have a talk through. I'm going to introduce Wheels for Wellbeing, which is the charity that I work for. Um, talk a bit about the background to what is uh, disability and disabled cycling in the UK. Um, what is disabled equity? What does that mean in its context for active travel and the wider benefits of disabled equity and mobility equity across the UK? and then bringing in how that links in with this idea of every journey, every time, making equitable active travel infrastructure, focusing on infrastructure, not because it's the only facet of active travel, but because it's very visual, it's easy to see, the concepts do cascade over into training, provision, funding, societal attitudes, it all matters. But I can tell you about infrastructure and you can see what I'm talking about relatively easily and then apply the principles onto any of the other factors. So Wheels for Wellbeing, we're a disabled people's organisation. That means that, yes, we're a charity, but we are run by and for disabled people. So making sure that disabled people's experiences are centred in everything that is going on. Um, it started in 2007, providing access to cycling at hubs, at centres that are off road, but then rapidly realising that actually, if you're talking about active travel, being stuck in a velodrome is very much like going um, riding in a pedalo on a lake. It's lovely, it's fun, it's exercise and you're out with your friends, but it's not transport. And what we're concerned about here is transport, active travel for disabled people. We also still run all of these inclusive opportunities. They are also important. But if we're talking about active travel, that's quite a different thing. Um, I'm part of the campaigns and policy team. So we do training and consultancy like this. Um, there are publications such as our guide to inclusive cycling and surveys of disabled cyclists. Um, and we also campaign. Um, so at the moment, our big campaign is My Cycle, My Mobility Aid, trying to get cycles recognised as mobility aids for disabled people, which currently they are not in law. Um, this is with a focus on mobility justice, making sure that resources go to the people who have the least access to transport right now, possibly even no access. So somebody living in a terraced house with a big step out the front door, they can no longer get down the front step. They have nowhere to score door, a mobility scooter or a cycle, and they would need that to get to the shops. They're now totally housebound and absolutely dependent on others. We need to make sure that the people who have the fewest choices get options that they need so that they can live their lives to their fullest extent. We often hear, well, this isn't a big issue. It's quite small. It doesn't really affect that many people. And we're here to say, no, that's not correct. A fifth of the British population are disabled. Um, and those people, these people, including quite a few people here as well, um, are 50% more likely to live in poverty than a non-disabled person. And we're looking at why that is from a transport perspective. 
So 28% of disabled adults are in a household with no car against 15% of non-disabled adults. Disabled people are also much less likely to have a driving license or to be the main driver. And those are different things than a non-disabled person. So if you're in a house with a car, but you cannot drive, you do not have the mobility independence that somebody who's in the house with the car and can drive has. Um, so then you look at public transport, we all think, oh yes, disabled people can use public transport, but actually over 40% of UK stations are inaccessible. We find the same sort of thing with bus stops. And then if you even want to get to a bus stop or to a transport hub for active travel, only about 10% of mobility impaired people have an aid to allow them to complete a one kilometer journey actively. Now, 70% of disabled people are mobility impaired. So that's a lot of people that can't necessarily get to any public transport opportunities. Um, or to their local shop even, because one kilometre is not that far. That's less than a 15 minute walk for most non-disabled people. Um, and again, a lot of disabled people uh, are not feeling safe in their local area, which makes another barrier to getting out and travelling. And then we see, surprise, surprise, lots fewer journeys, 38% fewer journeys by disabled people um, than by non-disabled people which then cascades on to a much, much lower rate of employment for disabled adults of working age. And this is, this is figures for working age, 40% of disabled against 80% of non-disabled people in employment. Um, and we think that's really important and that improved active travel and transportation opportunities linking into public transport could really, really change this picture. So we then look at the numbers from our national survey from 2021 data um, of disabled cyclists. It's not a representative sample. This is disabled people who already cycle, whether that's at an inclusive cycling centre or independently for daily travel. Um, but Sustrans's figures say 33% of disabled people don't cycle currently, but would like to start, while 84% never cycle. Um, out of our data, um, Two thirds find cycling is easier than walking and most of the rest find cycling is of a similar difficulty to walking, but of course will take you a much longer distance. So it can be a really useful component of getting around. Um, most disabled cyclists that we have surveyed currently use standard two wheel bikes. There are a lot of factors around the cost of non-standard cycles and the availability, even when it comes down to things like getting them repaired, finding somebody who can cope with your clip-on hand cycle when it's got a broken clip, where are you going to take it? Let alone when you've got your cycle, where are you going to store it? If you live in a flat, how are you going to get it up the stairs? If you don't have suitable storage at ground level that is level access, you will not be able to use it. And of course, that applies to families as well. If you've got some a family living in a small house, putting three, four, five, six bikes into the house is going to be impossible, let alone if anyone needs a larger mobility aid. We've also found that um, disabled cyclists are very likely to be using e-assist. Again, it's expensive. So people find it difficult to access that, but it's a real game changer in terms of disabled mobility. You might not be able to do it without the power, but with the power, you can get anywhere. So then we look into the barriers. Um, and we can see we've got a photo here of a woman riding a cargo tricycle. It's got two big wheels at the front. Um, it's the same width as a standard trike or a, car, a child trailer. So it's not particularly wide but she's just behind an A-frame barrier made of metal that she cannot get through. Behind her is what's obviously quite a busy road. So we see that disabled cyclists are disproportionately excluded from what would be the traffic-free infrastructure that's safer and easier to learn to ride on. So getting access to learning to ride is incredibly difficult for disabled people. Not only can you not necessarily get hold of a cycle, but you don't necessarily have anywhere to ride it or store it once you do. Um, so we found the barriers that people ordered. Again, these are numbers from people who are disabled and cycle. 53% said infrastructure is an ongoing barrier for them. 35% said parking or storage of their cycle is an ongoing barrier to accessing cycle. 33% cost, 30% unable to hire a cycle. And we see lots of different hire schemes, short term and long term going in. Most of those are for bikes. Often they're heavy. Often the step throughs aren't that low. Often the saddle heights won't drop as low as you might necessarily need. Um, so there are problems with accessing hire cycles easily and 
um, cheaply. Um, then you face abuse. If you're on a road, drivers will get upset. If you're cycling wide, you can see that a tricycle is going to need to come quite a long way out into the road to miss the gutters at the edge. So you're going to be riding wide. You're probably going to be riding relatively slowly. So you're going to face problems from drivers being aggressive quite frequently. Um, and you'll also face problems if you're on traffic free paths where you're seen as a larger obstruction. Um, people are not necessarily going to be as considerate as they should be towards you. So abuse is a big problem. And then again, as we said, just getting access to trying out cycles and training as inclusive cycling opportunities is a barrier. So in terms of um, equity, what are we meaning? And I'm aware this is a word that people probably won't be that familiar with. So if we look at this picture, we've got a top section where there are four people. All of them have the same bike that's been given to them. The woman in a wheelchair can't use the bike at all. There's a very tall man looking extremely cramped. There's a woman who looks perfectly comfortable. She's got the right bike for her. And there's a child who can't really reach the pedals riding it. We're not interested in equality. What we want to see happening is equity, where the woman who uses a wheelchair has a hand cycle trike. The big man has a large bike. The woman has the same thing she had in the first place. And the child has a suitably sized bike as well. Um, and the thing about equity, everyone guessing what they need, is that everybody doesn't have the same costs or barriers at that point. So we need mobility justice where the resources and funding are directed to give the most benefit to those who otherwise have the fewest options. So the person with the hand cycle tricycle is going to need more funding and better infrastructure, wider spaces, than the people riding the bikes, for example. So this applies across the board, whether you're talking about getting a hold of cycles or other mobility aids. And if I'm saying cycles, I'm meaning um, a broader idea as well, including mobility scooters, which basically are the same size, shape and speeds as a cycle, cycle um, and wheelchairs and anything else that somebody might need to use as a mobility aid that moves at a similar speed to a cycle. Um, finance, training, laws and regulations are all things that we need to see equity happening in. And then we think about who this benefits. So we've already said that a fifth of the population are disabled. So that's already a really big chunk of people. And of course, people aren't static. Most of us will have mobility impairments by the time that we are 80 years old. And I think we probably all hope to hit that age. It's then a majority of people who are going to need assistance in terms of mobility aids to get around. So everybody benefits from disabled equity. Um, people with lower mobility get affected right away. And so we start with children. Children often in our society do not have independent mobility. Largely that's because of infrastructure factors, because of safety factors are the same things that disabled people are talking about. So we benefit parents and carers as soon as children have independent mobility. That's a really important factor. If your kids can get to school back by themselves, you're not having to make that run. All of a sudden your time has been freed up. You can spend time doing things you actually want with them or taking on extra hours at work or whatever it might happen to be. You affect anyone who doesn't drive for whatever reason, anyone who travels with disabled people. So that might be that somebody is taking out non-disabled children to the park. If you have an accessible space, a disabled person can take out the people that they care for to go interesting places. Um, it totally frees up a lot of different people to do things. Um, anyone who's less confident, who might be feeling a bit wobbly, who might be feeling a little bit anxious, they might not define themselves as disabled, but if the infrastructure is not of a good enough quality, if the provision is not of a good enough quality, they are being disabled by that in just the same way that somebody with an impairment would call themselves disabled. Um, we've got, um, people who are making multi-stage journeys, because often our cycle routes and infrastructure think about radial journeys into a city centre and out again. Whereas if you're making multi-stage journeys to the shops, the GP, the school run, the nursery, into work, back out again, doing it all in reverse, you need a whole web of networks. You need the whole space to be accessible, which means you're hitting those same issues. Um, if you are, oh, this is not um, clicking on properly. Um, businesses with cargo cycles, um, older people, and transporting shopping, um, are all factors which um, you can see that it, it's actually it's hitting everybody at some time or another in their life. But even if you are really convinced that it's not going to affect you, um, actually the wider community will benefit as well. Because once you've got more people out and about because their area is accessible, you get increased local activity. 
which means you get decreased crime and antisocial behavior because you've got the natural surveillance going on. People tend not to do things they really shouldn't be doing when there are other people watching. Um, you get decreased congestion because people aren't having to make all of these short journeys by car. They've got the option of not doing it. So drivers who still are having to drive or who still want to drive benefit as well. Businesses get massively increased footfall. We've seen from the Living Streets Pedestrian Pound Report, they've got all sorts of different studies compiled in there showing massive increases in income for local businesses when you have improved active travel. Um, and then you get financial benefits at a household and a business level. Health improves because you've got decreased air pollution, so that affects absolutely everybody. And you've got a decreased risk of collisions because you've got fewer people driving. So you've got more and you've got um, more people out and about reduced vehicle speeds and you're going to get fewer deaths and injuries. Um, so that's a whole lot of different things to think about. Um, and then we move on to the active travel picture a little bit more thoroughly. So what we're hearing a lot about in active travel circles at the moment is this idea of mode shift, where we're talking about taking people who are driving and getting them onto walking, wheeling and public transport. What I've just been talking about is mobility equity, getting spaces and funding directed to people who currently don't have mobility options. Now, both of these have the effect of increasing walking, wheeling and cycling, whether it's somebody who currently can't get out at all or who is restricted can get out and about, somebody who is having to have carer journeys being made to them or who has different disadvantages that are meaning other people are driving or they are having to drive a lot. If you direct for mobility equity, you change things for the people who are currently the most disadvantaged. So that could be in terms of ensuring that people have independence of mobility, which might then mean that they can have access to employment. It might mean that they are able to maintain or take on caring and family responsibilities and will have big impacts on a disabled person and the people around them's mental and physical health. So, um, for example, if you can get to the local park with a family, a whole family benefits from using that green space. If the disabled person in the household cannot get there, it might well be that nobody can get there. You've had a knock on effect on quite a lot of people. Um, financial implications of being able to get into employment, having reduced caring uh, needs, um, all sorts of different benefits coming, mm. especially if you can then have cheaper transport, you're not having to drive in a massively expensive adapted vehicle potentially, because you've got options for getting around actively. Um, and you've got community <coughs> benefits, you can contribute to your community if you can access your community. But what we hear mostly about is mode shift, where we're seeing the greatest benefits given to people who already have multiple mobility options. We're talking about paying people to scrap their vehicle, which is, you know, great. OK, let's get polluting vehicles off the road. But on the other hand, these are people who already have a car and we're paying them to move somewhere else rather than putting the funding for people who currently don't have a car and giving them an option of getting anywhere at all. And why are we seeing that? Well, OK, the people who are affected by mobility equity are generally less powerful and less vocal. It's hard to measure the impact of somebody not having to give up work because their mum or their auntie doesn't need somebody coming in three times a day because actually they can get themselves out, thanks so very much, and they can sort out their own meals and they're, it's still independent. Um, but it's still an impact that is there. Uh, whereas with mode shift, the people who are affected are by definition drivers and people in households that own cars. They are powerful and vocal. And it is easy to measure the impact of we have scrapped 5,000 cars, we have given out this number of bikes. It's something that you can see much more easily, even though the impacts of each exist in terms of the active travel rates. And clearly the more important side in terms of justice is the mobility equity end. So if we're talking about mobility equity and saying everyone benefits, what's it going to feel like if we've got that? Well, what it's going to feel like is Spontaneous. So you're not going to have to plan or book when you want to go out actively, whether you're cycling, walking or wheeling, you're just going to be able to do it. You'll be able to find the information you need, whether that's looking at a website, whether it's having decent signage around the streets, it can be all sorts of different factors that let you know that you will be able to do what you want to do when you want to do it. And it means that you can do it independently. You're not having to wait for somebody else. That could mean that you have a personal assistant you have a personal assistant that's absolutely fine that's your way of being independent but it means that you're not having to call on somebody else ask for somebody else's permission and convenience for you to be able to do something that you want to do 
So moving on to convenience, you have to have a consistent experience. That means that the pavement has to be open and usable every single time. And in a catastrophe where there's been a crash or a tree has fallen over, you need to know that there are multiple routes that you can take as alternatives to get away from that so that you can still complete your journey. You need to know that if you are making a journey actively, you will get to your destination and back comfortably and safely. Um, so actually, I've just not mentioned the parking there, having suitable parking. Um, I mentioned in the, the previous talk that they've built a 42 million pound leisure centre near where I live. It has no accessible cycle parking. Every single piece of cycle parking is up a step. So you cannot cycle there if you are a mobility impaired cyclist. The end. Um, and that is about having this chain of journeys where the worst link in the chain is what determines whether or not you can complete that journey. Um, we need safety, and that's not just from drivers, which is the one we often remember for cycling, of, oh, you don't want to be on road with drivers. You also need to not be in secluded spaces where you're facing harassment and assault risk. Disabled people are at massively increased risk of harassment and assault compared to non-disabled people. And obviously women are at massively increased risk compared to men. Um, there are lots of different communities that face specific things under the Equality Act. You've got the protected characteristics and pretty much any one of those protected characteristics will face increased risk of harassment and assault compared to somebody who does not share those characteristics. Um, and then we've got infrastructure hazards, which often get completely forgotten, where a surface might become slippery in certain weathers, or um, there might not be very good visibility on a bend. Um, and those things actually can create every bit as much of an obstacle as um, a badly parked car. Um, so we need to ensure that people have this comfort within their journey, that they feel it's something that they can just do without even thinking about it. You need to have few soft mm -hmm. starts, the infrastructure that welcomes you in, and of course, the access to suitable cycles. So looking at that welcoming infrastructure next. So with the concept of having every journey accessible every time, we need to be designing out barriers. And most of the barriers we see in our built infrastructure are by definition designed to be there. Somebody has designed them and whether or not they've thought of them as a barrier, somebody has made that infrastructure, it's been put together following conventions, following historic practices. And we end up with situations where there are barriers built in literally into our cityscapes and into our countryside, such as, high speed limits of above 20 miles an hour, tight turns, <clears throat> steep cross falls. So a cross fall is when you're going across a slope and you will be tipping sideways. The more a cross fall is, the harder it is to get across as anyone who is not walking unimpaired will know. Um, doors and gates, if they don't open automatically, they are a wall. Um, so if you have gates that are latched on your paths, um, to many mobility users, you might as well have just built a fence across it. Um, and other access control barriers that have narrow widths are equally um, problematic. Steps and curbs, it might only be two inches high, but to somebody who is being pushed along with an assistant in a manual wheelchair, that might not be passable. Uh, loose and uneven surfaces, gravels, anything that's broken up or difficult can be incredibly painful or just lose traction entirely for mobility users. Lighting is important. Visibility in terms of sight lines so you can check what's coming. Crossings that are uncontrolled. Um, we assume that people can walk at um, 1.2 meters per second over a crossing. That's about four kilometers an hour. A lot of people can't do that. And if you are somebody with a mobility impairment, you can't do that little run that people do to get across the road a bit more quickly when a car starts coming. So controls on crossings are really important on higher speed roads or busier roads for people with impairments. Spaces that are secluded can be very problematic. Narrow paths, shared space, street furniture, and steep ramps are all infrastructure measures that are designed in that we need to make sure are designed in ways that don't negatively affect um, people who have um, mobility needs or other disabilities that affect their use of public spaces. But then we need to think about how they all interact when other factors come into play. What about that cafe that just put chairs and tables onto the pavement? Is it now blocked? What about the roadworks? Why does roadworks signage always go on the pavement and narrow it? Why are the signs for the drivers not in the road? What about if people are out shopping and the space is busy, it's crowded, that can make it massively more difficult to navigate through. Um, what about weather conditions? If it's icy, windy, wet or dark? What if it's really hot? Is there enough shelter? 
and maintenance is an absolutely critical one. So um, if we're considering vegetation maintenance, our hedges being planted too close to sides, our brambles being strimmed back, um, our leaves being cleared, so our paths becoming slippery. What about gritting? Are we seeing gritting happening on the paths that are for active travel. Um, so in Stockholm, they altered, according to gender mainstreaming, um, the gritting protocols on their paths and had a massive reduction in injuries. So instead of gritting and clearing the roads first, they gritted and cleared pavements near schools and nurseries. And they found that that reduced men's and women's injury rates hugely. They'd done it because they realized that actually gritting was a gender discriminatory issue but everybody benefited. And we're seeing that same principle of if you bring in equity, everybody benefits. Nobody doesn't benefit from having litter cleared out of pathways. Everybody benefits from this. So the principle that we're looking for is designing for the greatest possible accessibility in the worst possible conditions. So whether a space hasn't been maintained in two years, it's throwing it down with rain, it's dark, it's winter, and it's busy. Is that space still usable? And you need to be thinking about that when it's designed, not a lovely architect's drawing that shows a sunny weather where it's empty or there's just a little scattering of people around. Um, and it certainly is daytime as well. Um, so making sure that the conditions that you're designing for are not the conditions that you put in the publicity brochure. So we see lots of bad examples. These are actually all mine. They're from near where I live, which is in Derby. Um, but I think every city, every area has the same kinds of infrastructure um, that we'll see. So in every one of these three pictures that are shown, it, there's poor design being shown. The left-hand picture is a 40 mile an hour road with um, busy traffic, it's wet weather. Uh, there's a van parked blocking um, a mandatory cycle lane which has double yellow lines. Uh, there's a very bumpy pavement and another van which means that the pavement is also completely obstructed. The cycle lane itself is a third filled with water and is only maybe a metre wide at most anyway. So it's really badly designed um, to a way that is unsafe for pedestrians and cyclists. And it is also being used inappropriately in a way that is not being enforced. The next one is again an urban 40 mile an hour road. You're going to see this one at the next slide, which is just a sort of a last discussion point. Um, one, because we've only got a couple of minutes left, um, where you've got a chicane made of railings. Um, which forces users to point away from the traffic line that they're about to have to cross if they are assisted mobility users or on a larger cycle. You can just see the front of my tandem is at the back of this photo. Um, the barriers have also meant that lots of leaves have collected on the crossing and then have mulched down because there's minimal maintenance ongoing. So you've now got a really slippery surface to get across. Um, when you get to the point where you need to push the pedestrian button, you're now going to have to look more than 180 degrees over your shoulder to see if the vehicles are actually stopping. This is on a route near a hospital, there are emergency vehicles and vehicles don't always stop. So somebody did die on this crossing in December um, because it has very, very poor sight lines and then the maintenance has made it even more difficult to use. Um, the third photo is showing again, a control crossing in the rain where the crossing has gone underwater. The main road surface does not have any rainwater on it, just the crossing is flooded to the point that you can't see the bottom of the water, which is going to be highly problematic to get across for anyone who can't just nip around the edge of the puddle, which is pretty much anybody with pretty much any form of sensory or physical impairment. So again, you've got a poor design that has been installed poorly. And I know I picked up earlier, as I've said that the push button is positioned, they're generally 40 centimetres back from the edge of the road. If you're using a mobility device, you're going to need to have your front wheels or your child's push chair or somebody's wheelchair in the road in order to push that button. Um, so those are really problematic. And the tactile slope down into the carriageway, which means that you're now restraining a mobility device from rolling into a 40 mile an hour carriageway as you're waiting for that light to change. But then we see some really good examples. So here's a lovely one, which is from West Bridgeford in Nottingham. We've got the speed limit coming down to 20 miles an hour as drivers come off the busy road, which is at the front of the photo. There's a raised table going up across the crossing uh, with giveaway signs for drivers, meaning that the cycle track and the pedestrian um, area, which are separate and they are slightly curb segregated. It doesn't show that well in this photo, 
both have priority to cross over the road. Um, that's a major route down to the National <coughs> Water Sports Centre, so it's a really important cycle route. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but this element of it has been done really well, and you can see just how much more welcome it, it looks from an active travel perspective than a congested crossing that's looking a bit flooded and a bit difficult and the vehicles are too fast. This says it's your space to anybody using active travel, and it says it's their space to anyone who's driving, which is just what we need to see. So just very quickly having a look through, because we're at the end of time, um, we see a lot of the it's not that bad principle. So we're back on this road again, which is a 40 mile an hour urban dual carriageway, nursing home on the right, school on the left, lots of social housing and housing and multiple occupation in each direction. So this is a very well used crossing. So if we wipe it out and make it look a bit simpler, um, you've got tactile paving, controls on the crossings, chicane down the middle, two lanes to cross at a time with a narrow pedestrian um, refuge in the middle, which has this chicane on it. Um, there's an orange line going across in a sort of an S bend, which shows the sort of shape you're going to have to make if you are using a larger cycle or mobility scooter. The larger your device, the more slowly you're needing to move and um, the more encumbered you are, the bigger that bend is going to be and the more you're going to end up in conflict with absolutely anybody else who is using that crossing. And we're not talking conflict in this shouting at each other kind of way, but just having to negotiate that crossing and an, oops, I'm sorry, I'm in your way kind of a friendly way that is actually quite stressful to be doing multiple times every single day um, so you can see there's a whole range of different problems so some of them are not visible so the long delay for a five second green man to cross the road no audible signal the visual visual signal is across the road only so if you have no long distance vision there is no way for you to know apart from the rotating cone that something is um is actually letting you cross. If you don't have a hand free to hold that rotating cone, how on earth are you supposed to ever know when you're supposed to cross the road? The space is very clearly driver dominated. You've got straight line access for cars and very wiggly access for active travel. It's saying active travel, you're not important drivers, you are important. It's a clear message. We've got the uneven low friction paving, which is on a slope down to the road. That's what tactiles are by definition. We can recognize that they're absolutely necessary for visually impaired people, but at the same time, we can recognize that they are problematic for mobility impaired people. Um, we've got non-flush curbs, which mean that users of smaller wheeled mobility devices particularly or people approaching at an angle are likely to stop in the carriageway, which can really surprise drivers who are expecting to start moving again. But if you go fast into a curb as a wheelchair user, you're likely to flip yourself out and nosedive, which is not a thing that you want to be doing. Um, and we've got that very narrow space that we've already discussed. So what can we do to change that? Well... You can take the railings out, for starters. You can stretch the access that pedestrians have for the junction across the full width. That hasn't changed width. That's the same width as the junction was before. It's just being coloured in. It's very easy to colour in a crossing on a design, but it's much harder to do it in reality. And the tactile paving has also been stretched down to make the full width of the crossing. Um, so take the railings out, indicate a pedestrian space using a colour and hopefully a level change make the surface transitions flush to make it easier to get on and off the carriageways and hopefully widen that crossing quite a lot. Um, and then there are other bits that you can also do that you wouldn't see, such as reducing the speed limit down from a 40 limit to a 30 or a 20 for this urban road where actually I cycle this an awful lot. I never go slower than the cars junction to junction. Uh, they overtake me, but I catch them back up again at the next set of traffic lights and I am not a fast cyclist. Um, Retime the crossings to make active travel comfort. Make sure that they change when you push the button quickly. Make sure that they stay changed for long enough. Maybe let people right the way across as well. Um, put some audio and visual signals in that are rather more accessible. Um, and then you can consider reallocating carriageway space, which is difficult. Um, reducing gradients, which is difficult. Widening the refuge does mean reallocating carriageway space. These are more expensive measures, but they all can be done. Um, so. That's my last one. I've got contact details and um, references and things on the next couple of slides. Um, SUS trans people have these this presentation and I'm welcome to send it out to anybody at all who wants it. Um, I'm going to leave it on this one just because it's a bit of a discussion point slide. And if anyone has any questions. I've got a question. Thanks, Kate. 
Um, so if an individual, on an individual level, if somebody sees poor infrastructure or infrastructure that's impacting them negatively, what might be the best thing that they can do as an individual to try and influence it so that uh, infrastructure can change or can be noted to be necessary to change? What, what can an individual do on in that scale? All right, so some of it depends your situation precisely. So if you are a person with a protected characteristic under the Equality Act, then you can raise that as discriminatory under the Equality Act if you are personally impacted. So if you are disabled, member of an ethnic minority, a religious group, I'm not sure how you would um, necessarily have a, a religious link into a active travel infrastructure, but maybe if it was um, actually being able to access a place of worship, that could certainly come into it if you're disabled. Um, age is a protected characteristic, so particularly older and younger. Um, maternity, um, LGBTQIA+, um, and um, sex and gender are, are all um, protected characteristics. And if I've missed one, I'm sorry, because I sometimes do miss characteristics there. Um, so you can raise that as an Equality Act factor it will be with your local authority or whoever owns the infrastructure uh, that is there SUSTRANS obviously will often talk to you and give some advice and contact details so contact your local SUSTRANS that's a good start um, many local authorities will have neighborhood boards or neighborhood forums um, places where you can give feedback if it's simple things like there are potholes um, if you go on to fix my street um, then you can just use Fix My Street, report issues like um, littering, fly tipping, potholes, uh, bins that need emptying and have spilled out across the carriageway, hedges that need cutting back, any of that kind of thing, you should be able to report directly either to your local authority or to Fix My Street, and they should just get done straight away. So if it's big, you'll need to raise it as an infrastructure issue, either using Equality Act stuff through an access um, officer or similar or through your highways department. If it's a small repair type issue, you should be able to get that done fairly easily. In terms of um, the uh, guidance and so on, the best practice, there's a lot of guidance around, but all of it is at the moment non-mandatory in terms mm. of infrastructure and so on. What's being done to change that so that the design standards and guidance for cycling infrastructure and for walking becomes the same level of you know priority and, and quality control as say building the motorway where you wouldn't have different local variations uh, yes and they are all absolutely standardized so active travel england are now saying they won't fund projects unless they meet ltn 120 criteria so that's a really big help uh, but it's not the same thing as having mandatory standards and yes as wheels for well-being we are asking that the standards for cycling walking and wheeling infrastructure should be mandatory in the same way that baseline road standards are of course we're waiting for the updated manual for streets and there are challenges ongoing for um, inclusive mobility the last design guides for walking and wheeling infrastructure um, have been challenged on uh, not having consulted disabled people i believe is the major issue there um so yeah <laughs> Hopefully it's coming, but yeah, we don't yet have the mandatory standards that are really are needed, I agree. Anybody? Okay, so if we finish up, I think we've just hit the end of time as well, so perfectly done, thank you. Yeah, yeah, we have, so just a little round of applause, thank you. Um, will you be spending any more time here at the session, at the activities? Um, yeah, I mean, the, more activities later. I'll be around for uh, till whenever. So, yes, thank you for asking exactly the right number of questions. I didn't run over this time. <laughs> perfect. perfect. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. There are a few more activities that are starting. Uh, there's a cycling skills session that's starting at uh, 10 past two. Uh, I think there is an art session just next door if you want to get involved in a collaborative art experience. Um, and I think that's it's for now as well. It's a focus group that's already started. That's halfway through. Yeah. No. Starts at two. Oh, starts at two. Uh, so if you want to click onto that, speak to me or another substantive member of staff, uh, Abby, who's just spoken at the back. Uh, and yeah, thank you again. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.